when I was 18, I didn't really know what to do with my life. All I knew was that I wanted to see something of the world. So not knowing more about how to go about it, I started to get a double degree, law and languages, which then served me very well during the rest of my career. I landed my first job with the European Commission in Brussels. Uh, at the time when my country, Austria, wasn't even a member state of the European Union yet. And when after a few years I decided to enter the Austrian Foreign Service, I had the good luck that my country then asked to become a member of the European Union. And uh, since I was one of the few persons in Austria who had seen the EU work from the inside, I was selected as a member of the team which was to negotiate that accession treaty. Um, it was the beginning of decades of multilateral work. I then spent about 20 years in European affairs, in Brussels, in Vienna, in London and in Dublin. And then I got promoted to Director General for Legal and Consular Affairs, which was a wide portfolio that included many multilateral issues like asylum and migration, but also combating international transborder crime. Uh, I also became the first Austrian coordinator against human trafficking during that phase. I suppose it was this multilateral track record uh, which prompted my minister to send me to Geneva four years ago, uh, which is a unique uh, theatre for diplomats with an unequalled variety of topics and international organisations. Uh, what we do here covers just about all the big topics of our time. Well, the Human Rights Council is to Geneva what the Security Council is to New York. That is to say, the politically most sensitive body in town and arguably the most visible in the media. Uh, it both are seismographs of the geopolitical developments. The Human Rights Council is a gigantic machinery. It involves thousands of people, UN staff, delegates from member states, civil society, representatives, academia, the media, uh, special rapporteurs and other mechanisms. It is a huge machinery um, and it was the honour of my life to get elected president but I must say it was not an easy aircraft carrier to steer. The business of the Human Rights Council is the unfinished human rights agenda of the international community. That includes the classical subjects which will never be finished as well as newly emerging human rights challenges like digitalization and climate change. The media usually focus on the differences of opinions and on the clashes, but what in my opinion really counts about the Human Rights Council are the success stories. But these success stories hardly ever come as blockbusters, they come as baby steps. In the 14 years of its history, the Human Rights Council had developed precedents for just about anything before I took office. But what happened in 2020 really recalled uh, John Lennon's famous line, life is what happens to you when you're busy making other plans. So uh, we had to adapt to the pandemic and I'm honored to say that the Human Rights Council was the first body in Geneva which came out from the lockdown. It was the first uh, body in the whole UN system which adopted a formal UN text on the human rights implications of the pandemic. Um, and it was the only UN body, as far as I know, that completed its full program of work. Together we developed the modalities of how to work in the pandemic, uh, which was basically having hybrid meetings. And by doing so, the Human Rights Council became a kind of laboratory for the whole UN system. Some of the novelties we invented, like having very high-ranking speakers in meetings which, in all likelihood, they wouldn't have attended physically, might well remain even after the pandemic. Uh, this is actually a very good moment to ask the question about UNECE, because it's going to turn 75 next year. So this is a good opportunity to do some stock taking about lessons learned and some brainstorming about the future we want for the organization. UNECE has a wealth of experience in cooperating in many areas, in an increasing number of fields across the region. Uh, and that region is huge, it stretches, as you know, from Canada to Kazakhstan, and it has been cooperating over all these years, regardless of whatever the political circumstances at any given time were. The special feature about UNECE is that it was always ahead of the curve. It always asked the questions of the future. By doing so, it defined myriads of standards over the years, in particular for transport and trade, but also in other areas, which most people benefit from without actually knowing where they come from. 
UNECE has always been exploring new ideas, trying to find solutions to new challenges and at the same time making sure that all the countries in the region can catch up. Today again we see that UNECE is asking the questions of the future, questions which are 20 years ahead, like what rules and standards do we need for automatic cars, what lessons can we learn from the experience of smart cities. Two years ago, very presciently, UNECE started to look at all its activities through the lens of circular economy, which is exactly what all the regions should do if we want to master the challenge of climate change. Uh, given all these uh, success stories, it's a mystery to me why UNECE is not better known to a wider public. But that's maybe the flip side of one of its assets, which is that it focuses on technical cooperation rather than on political sensitivities. Um, I would be very glad if I could contribute during my mandate to making UNEC a little bit more visible uh, in the run-up to its 75th anniversary. I think that the organization would truly, truly merit it.